on the screen, we've got a list of different molecular formulae. Some of these are correct and some of these are incorrect. Could you pause the video and try to figure out which ones are correct and which ones are incorrect? Okay, let me help you. CO2 is correct, C2O is incorrect, H2O is correct, H4O is incorrect, NH3 is correct, NH5 is incorrect, CH4 is correct, C4H is incorrect, NO2 is correct, NO6 incorrect. You might be wondering, wait a minute, how do I know which molecular formula is correct and which ones are incorrect? I've heard of H2O, I know it's water, and so I know it's correct. I've heard of CO2, I know that's carbon dioxide, so I know that that's correct. Right? But do I have to memorize every molecular formula there is in the world to know if it's correct or not? Or do we have some other method? Well, there's a simple method called the crisscross method, which will be our topic for this video. Using the crisscross method, we can predict the molecular formula of a particular molecule. Let's begin with a simple example, H2O. Okay, let's say I want to predict the molecular formula. How do I go about it? The crisscross method says, step one, write down both the elements along with their valencies. Let's do that. Hydrogen, oxygen. Write down their valencies just below them. Hydrogen is one and the valency of oxygen is two. Right? Great. We're done with step one. Let's move ahead to step two. Step two says cross multiply. What exactly does this mean? Let me explain. Draw two arrows like this that are kind of, you know, cross shaped and move the valency of the first element towards the second element following the arrow. Move the valency of the second element towards the first element following the arrow. We're done with the second step. We've arrived at the molecular formula H2O1. Think about it. This one is kind of redundant, so we're going to get rid of that. Okay, so we're left with H2O. What does H2O tell us? It tells us that every molecule of water or every molecule of H2O has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Okay, that means if I have a huge sample of water with a lot of water, maybe I take a liter of water and I calculate the number of hydrogen atoms and the ox number of oxygen atoms and find the ratio, I would have a ratio of 2 ratio 1. Okay, great. Now, let me go ahead and try this same method for a different example. Okay, so step one of the method says write down the elements along with their valencies. Let me do that. So I've got magnesium and chlorine this time. Let me write down their valencies, two and one. Step one is done. Let's move to step two. Step two says cross multiply. Let's go ahead and do that. There you go. And let's move the one as well. Okay, amazing. Step two done. We end up with a molecular formula Mg1Cl2, right? But this one is redundant, so I'm going to remove it and I end up with MgCl2. Now, let me just remind you, for every magnesium atom, we have two chlorine atoms, right? Okay, great. Let's move on to our next example. This is with aluminium and oxygen. Let's write down their valencies, 3 and 2, and do our cross multiplication. There you go. We've got Al2O3. For every two atoms of aluminium, we have three atoms of oxygen. Isn't it? Amazing. Let's move on to our next example. We're going to practice a lot of examples so that you can kind of learn as you go. I'd encourage you to even pause the video and try it on your own so that you can get the answer by yourself. Let's take our next example, sodium and chlorine. The valencies of both these are 1. So what happens when we cross multiply? We end up with any one Cl1. But both these ones are kind of redundant, right? So let's get rid of them. There you go, we get any Cl. This is sodium chloride. This is what we eat as common salt on a daily basis. Let me again just remind you, for every sodium atom, we have one atom of chlorine, right? Okay. What about aluminium and phosphorus? Both of them have valencies 3. So what happens when we cross multiply? We get Al3 and P3, right? Okay, let me remind you again, for every three atoms of aluminium, I have three atoms of phosphorus, right? Wait a minute, can I not say that I can cancel this stuff out and get 1 ratio 1 as the ratio, right? Of course I can. But can I do the same thing here as well? Of course you can, right? So what we've got here is Al1P1. Pause for a moment and look at it. We've got Al1P1. When we get rid of those redundant ones, we're left with Alp, right? Amazing. Let's move on to our next example, carbon and oxygen. Valencies, 4 and 2. Cross multiply, and we end up with C2O4. Great. So for every two carbon atoms, we have four oxygen atoms, right? Wait a minute. 
again, is there scope for some cancellation? Can we bring this ratio down to the lowest integer ratio? Well, of course we can. 2 goes into 4 twice, and so we get 1 ratio 2. Right? But if we did that cancellation here, we can do the cancellation here as well, and we'd get C1 O2. Right? But since this 1 is kind of useless, we go ahead and write it as CO2. So that actually means that every molecule of CO2 has one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms, right? Amazing. I'm sure you've got a good idea of how the crisscross method or the cross multiplication method, some people call it, works, right? Now let me just summarize with an example, kind of revise the entire method so that you don't forget. Step one says write both the elements along with their valencies. Let me do that for our last example, SI and oxygen. Valency is four and two. Step one is done. Step two says cross multiply. Draw our arrows and move the valencies. There you go. Step two is done and we've ended up with Si2O4. Again, for every two atoms of silicon, we have four atoms of oxygen. Now, step three says we want to get the lowest integer ratio of these numbers. Two goes into four twice, right? And so we can cancel these and get one ratio two. If we can do the cancellation here, we can do the cancellation here as well and arrive at the same numbers and we get Si1O2, right? And so we've gotten the lowest possible integer ratio and with that step three is done. Well, maybe some of you are wondering why do you want to divide with HCF? Where did this HCF come up from? Well, if you, you know, remind yourself about the mathematics you studied a few years ago, you'd realize that to get the lowest integer ratio in some kind of fraction or ratio, you've got to divide by the highest common factor. Okay, back to the story. So we've got an SI1O2. Let's get rid of the redundant one and make it neat and clean and call it SiO2, right? Okay, I have a disclaimer before I let you go. Don't use this method randomly with every element, right? Don't just pick up some two random elements and try to get them to make a molecule. It doesn't work that way. Ensure that both the elements that you are using do bond with each other before you proceed with this method. Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.